We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. My name is Chris Fluitt, I'm lead pastor here at Redemption Church. We are a non-denominational church here in Plano, Texas. We are not a mega church, but we are a mighty church. We are mighty through God and His Spirit and all of His Word. And, and I'm so glad to be a part of this church body. I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Our society has some important days that we try to remember. We try to remember these days. Raise your hand if you know what we are trying to remember on these days. I'm going to give you some days throughout the year that we as a society try to remember. So raise your hand on each one if you know what I'm talking about. The third Monday of January. The third Monday of January. Anybody got that one? Anybody got it? Shout it out if you know it. Martin Luther King Day, marking the birthday of the great civil rights leader. How about the first Thursday of May? First Thursday of May. First Thursday of May, anyone? It is the National Day of Prayer. Our, we have a na- national day. And our nation has set aside a day and said we believe in prayer. And we're going to pray on this day. That's, that is May the 1st, all right? How about the second Sunday of May? What is that? Mother's Day. Very good. The last Monday of May. Memorial Day was formerly known as Decoration Day. It commemorates all men and women who have died in military service for this great nation, the United States of America. How about this? June 6th. June 6th. Anybody know this day? What is it? What is it? No. June 6th. June 6th. D-Day. D-Day, on this day in 1944, American soldiers and other allied forces landed on the shores of Normandy, France. This was a costly yet key victory in World War II. I'm thankful for the men and women who, uh, well, the men, there were, I don't think there are any women present, uh, that, that gave their life on that day. How about this one, the third Sunday of June? Father's Day, got it? All right, how about September 11th? We know September 11th, right? That's very recent. Actually, I didn't, I didn't know. We're trying to get a name for September 11th. It's called Patriot Day, observed as the National Day of Service and Remembrance. It occurs on September 11th each year in memory of the 2,977 people killed in the 2001 September 11 attacks. So it's called Patriot Day. How about this? The fourth Thursday in November. Thanksgiving, excellent work. A national holiday of giving thanks for the blessing of the harvest and of the preceding year. How about this one? It's coming up this next week, December 7th. Pearl Harbor Day, a day where we remember the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, 1941. December 25th, Christmas Day. It's the day that we try our best to... Uh, be materialistic pigs. No, we try our best to remember the birth of Christ. All right. So how did we do? It was kind of tough, right? We've got these days of remembrance. I'm going to throw one more out at you. November 22nd. Anybody, any people from Dallas know what November 22nd was? It was the JFK shooting. Very sad day. I, I didn't even mention days like talk like a pirate day, Star Wars day. Groundhog's Day, Boxing Day. See, those are the ones I should have named. Y'all all knew those. Bunch of weirdos in this church. All right. We have, these, we have these days of remembrance commemorating important events. And some of these days I talked about are incredibly important days. Days of extraordinary sacrifice Days of admirable achievement, even days of heartache and loss that we don't need to just forget about anytime soon. But we often still forget. We all know D Day is important. We forget. We all know Pearl Harbor Day is important. We all forget. We have these life altering moments in the history of a nation, like September 11th, 2001. And we know in that moment that life has changed forever. Remember that day? Uh, We can't imagine ever forgetting how we felt in the moment. In that moment, we're like, oh, I'll never 
have trouble remembering what I was doing when I heard the news, where I was, how I felt, how I responded, what I saw on TV. We know we'll never forget those things. But I got to tell you, humans are forgetful. But there are some things we can't forget. You would say that, right? Oh, there's some things we just can't forget. We're we're forgetful, but we're not that forgetful. But I, I just have to tell you, do you understand that that is exactly how people felt when they heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? In 1941, they said in that moment and said, we'll never forget this. This will be something our nation will never forget. In eight days, it will be December 7th. And very few people will remember that important day. Anymore, you have to like log on to Facebook and your your uncle that knows these things says, hey, it's Pearl Harbor Day. And you go, hey, everybody, it's Pearl Harbor Day. You suckers need to remember, even though you really didn't remember yourself. A little bit like that. The day that... Pearl Harbor happened, that infamous day, the waking of a sleeping giant. People could not imagine forgetting that day. They could not imagine a time period where people said, December 7th, I don't know what that is. That doesn't ring a bell. But all these years later, it is forgotten. It is forgotten. The very reason we have days of remembrance is simply because humans are forgetful. We got to put it on a calendar. It's got to go bleep, bleep on your computer, on your phone. Somebody has to say, hey, this is an important day. You ought to remember. We have to do that because, Anda, humans are forgetful. We have to work to remember. Anybody have an anniversary? You got to work to remember. Man, I got my phone. It reminds me like every month. Hey, that anniversary's coming. You're 11 months away, buddy. Get working. Don't dare forget it. Or someone's birthday. You have to to work to remember those important things. We have to constantly remind ourselves or we're going to forget. And then you're, you, you've been there. You've passed that day and some, maybe you went, oh man, it was my brother's birthday and I didn't call him. You're like, oh man, happy belated birthday. I can't believe I didn't call him on his birthday. You've been there. It is human nature to forget. And if we forget, can I tell you, you lose a lot more than just a memory. Let me tell you about some things you forget. You lose lessons learned from history. Man, it's painful to see the direction of our nation, because if you look at history, you already know what's going to happen. I won't go down that street, but if you don't know history, you are doomed to repeat it. it. We all know that, but when we don't forget these important lessons that were learned in those moments, we, we lose that history, and we actually are doomed to repeat it. Also, we lose our own story and our own identity. I think it's really sad when people don't know their heritage. They don't know their grandfather's story. They don't know their great-grandfather. They don't know their ancestry's ancestry's story. You lose your identity in that. We lose the proof that important accomplishments come from ordinary people. When you don't remember these, these special days, when you don't remember these special life events, the spiritual things that come from a life in God must be remembered. The spiritual things that come from a life in God, they must be remembered. In fact, God commands us to remember. God, has promised, God had promised to lead Israel from slavery in Egypt into the land God had promised Abraham. You know that story? It's in Exodus. In Joshua 4 comes the very moment they would need to always remember. It came that moment. Okay, guys, this is one of those important moments. This should be on our calendar. We should be circled. We should have a name for this day. And every day we repeat it. We remember this day every year. It would be the moment that they would cross over the River Jordan and enter into the promised land. It is the first time these slaves are getting to set foot. They've gone from slavery to wilderness wanderers now to 
kingdom people, free and, 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 and with, a, with the future. Let's read together. Joshua 4, going to read several verses here. Joshua 4, 1. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. Verse 3. And command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's foot, feet stood firm, 12 stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Verse 4, then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every Every tribe, amen. Verse 5, and Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulders, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 6, and this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What? mean ye by these stones what do these stones mean verse 7 then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and it passed over the Jordan the waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever it is reiterated in verse 22 tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Verse 23, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea. I'm going to say that again. The the Lord your God did to the Jordan River just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. Over Okay, lengthy reading. Thank you for staying with me on that. We need to remember. That's what this whole command of God is right here in Joshua 4. Listen up, Israel. You need to remember. God spoke to Joshua. It wasn't enough for them to walk into the miracle. You see, we think it's enough to just feel God's presence. We think it's enough to have the miracle. We think it's enough to go, oh, good, that good thing happened. God says, no, 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 not so quick. It wasn't enough for them to cross over from the wilderness into the promised land. It's not enough. It was not enough for them to experience God in the moment. Man, it is so cool when you're in the moment and you know God is doing something. You ever been there? Man, you are seeing God do the miracle right in front of you. You are seeing that person that no one ever thought would come to the Lord. You are seeing them melt before God and call on his end. That is a cool moment. People that are sick, you're seeing them raised from sickness and be healed. You're seeing someone get saved. You're seeing someone's sins be washed away. You're seeing that. That is a cool thing. But let me tell you, God wants you to know something. It's not enough. You need to remember you got to remember, God instructed them, commanded them to, be, to build a memorial to remember what God had done forever. It says those words, forever. It's a memorial forever. God told them to take time. Oh, but God, we got to get on to the next thing. No, no, no. You got to take time. In fact, they are standing in the middle of the ark. It's not clear to understand when you're reading that chapter, but it insinuates that the ark steps into the water all right before they ever stood into the water actually it parted so they're standing in the middle of the river bed and the ark stays there as everyone crosses and that ark is staying there and in the middle of crossing God speaks to Joshua and says no you don't just get everybody out of the riverbed right now you need to find stones right now you need to find the people from every tribe right now you've got to build a memorial right now now they've got stuff to do Ackley They've got other places to go. They need to set up camp. They need to find a water source. They need to start training an army because they've got wars that they're going to fight. There's a lot of stuff to do, but God says, that's going to have to wait. 
You need to build something where you will remember this forever. I tell you, sometimes you have that God moment and you're off to the next thing. Stop. Build that moment. Have that moment. Live in that moment. Go to the riverbed. Pull something out of that moment and carry it with you. God told them to use great effort. Now it says go in there and find a rock. But if you notice, it says find a rock and place it on their shoulders. All right, we got rocks that we hold like this. But then we got stones, big boulders that we're carrying like this. All right, put that on me. Okay, I'm going to carry that one. All right, look out. Help me. All right. Great effort needed to be. So Israel, you need to take time to remember. Israel, you need to take great effort effort in this and then God goes further he says everybody involved needs to be involved God told every tribe to be involved he said find a man from every tribe not just one tribe is doing this Benjamin good job way to build that memorial no all 12 tribes carry a stone. Everybody needs to be involved. Can I tell you real quick? When God does a miracle in your life, your whole family needs to be involved. When God does a miracle in you, your whole church needs to be involved. People need to be involved. They need, don't just sit on the sidelines and go, man, that was really good. Where are we going to go eat? No, get involved in it. Take time, take effort. Everybody get involved. Everybody get involved. You know what is it's like the most frustrating thing? I don't know if it's actually, I say that all often, but it's really top. It's top of the heap with me, really frustrating, is when you see God do something really awesome, powerful, and somebody's not plugged into that moment. And they're like, oh yeah, that's good. What? No. <laughs> We're talking about the mighty God just crossed, parted the waters and they walked over on dry land. No, don't give it one of those, uh that's good. No, fall over on your face before the Lord, people. Get into it. Be, be absolutely connected to what God's doing. God told them to build a memorial. God told them the memorial wasn't just for them, but it was for generations to come. God talks about their children uh, that, are, that are to come, but he also said that memorial is for those in the past. Right? It says that those that cross the Red Sea, because he says God's done for us at the Jordan what he's done at the Red Sea. So when you're building this memory and this memorial, you're actually connecting to everyone else in the past. Can I remind you that those that crossed the Red Sea did not cross the Jordan? Can I remind you that? But their memorial is in the promised land. Isn't that powerful? They're they never reached the promised land, but they're memorial. They're remembered. They're going to be planted in the promised land. And let me tell you, one day Jesus is going to come, and they're really going to be in the promised yeah. land. God's promises are yes and amen. They're true. All right. They weren't left in the wilderness. They are going to be in the promised land. So it connects the generation that was, but also connects the generation that is to come. Their children, let me tell you, what happened there in that moment also connects to us spiritually as the children, spiritual children of Abraham. God wanted them to remember, but can I tell you, God wants you to remember. God wants you to remember. Every story that's in your Bible, you can connect to it like it's your story because it is your story. You are part of the household of God. What happened for Isaiah, you can get excited about. Because you're a part of the household of God. What happened to the apostle Peter? How he walked out of a jail cell when in the morning he was supposed to have his neck cut with a, with a knife, with a sword and lose his head. But God sent an angel, open up the doors. You can rejoice over that like it's somebody that you absolutely live with. Because you're part of the household of faith. That's a part of that memorial. That's a part of connecting. All right. Israel needed to remember. Israel would face struggles. Would they face struggles in the future? Yeah. yeah. Would they have enemies in the future? Yeah. Good Lord, we forget about this, don't we? God works the miracles. It's like, oh man, it's easy street now. Bum, ba, 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 da, da. No, another problem every time. Another problem is always coming. Look at somebody and say, hey, another problem's coming. 
Look out, duck, it's coming. They needed to remember that the God who parted the Red Sea and brought them out of Egypt was the same God who parted the Jordan and brought them out from wandering nomads and brought them into a place of prominence and power. That that same God who crossed, that, that parted the Red Sea was the same God that parted the Jordan, that he would be the same God that would make a way out of no way when they faced battles. The same God who would work miracles with his same mighty hands when they were sick and dying. With the same God that they were surrounded by their enemy, they needed to remember that. But if you don't remember this, you're gonna freak out in the present. If you don't remember what God did for you yesterday, you are doomed to freak out again today. Every time, every time. If Israel would face their current problems with an understanding that comes from remembering what God had already done, it would make a world of difference for Israel. But they often forgot. Israel often forgot what they had done. You can look in your Old Testament. It's shocking. There are times, there are whole passages, their whole chapters, their whole books of, his, of, of their, their history where they went, we don't even know where the word of God is. Where's the law of God? Does anybody know where it is? Oh, I found these old scrolls in the temple. Let's read them. Oh my goodness, how could we have ever lost this? Who forgot these? This is God wrote this. This is the commands of God. It's in there. Crazy, crazy. Oh, we forgot to put out showbread. We forgot to keep, keep the lights burning in the tabernacle. On and on, they kept forgetting, they kept forgetting all these things. And then they'd run into their next problem and freak out, lose heart, say, God has killed us. We might as well go back to Egypt and be slaves, all that kind of stuff. David, the shepherd boy David, shows us how remembering God's victories lead to bigger victories in bigger arenas, and against bigger enemies. Let's look at it, 1 Samuel 17. We got a little bit more reading to go. It's all right if we read a little bit in church, isn't it? 1 Samuel 17, 32. David said to Saul, Saul is the king. So that's King Saul to you, mister. Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Pop quiz, what is the name of this Philistine? Goliath. All right, can someone describe him? Big. He's big. He is a giant. All right, and David, describe him. He is little and he is young. All right, 1 Samuel 17, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. So right here, we have the king of Israel. He doesn't remember everything God has done in the past. He's in the middle of the moment. He's freaking out. He's hiding in his tent saying, what do we do? We can't do anything. We're dead meat. We're we're just gonna bide our time until Goliath comes and kills us all. Oh, you wanna fight him? Well, you can't fight him. You don't know anything. Wake up, dude. This is not God's first day on the job. This is not God's first battle. This is not God's first miracle. I think God's up to it. But Saul forgot. Israel forgot. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Now we can pause right there. Because that almost seems like an unrelated story. You, you ever some, have, have, hear someone start off on a story and you're like, when they start, you're like, what does that have to do with anything? Listen, there's this big giant, but don't worry. I've been keeping my father's sheep. It's like, where is this story going? <laughs> Who is this kid? Get this kid out of here. But he goes on. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, verse 35, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine. I love this. He doesn't even name this giant. 
He's not even worthy of being named. His name is not worthy of the lips of David. There is another name that is worthy of the lips of David. By the way, he walks into battle. He says, you come to me with a sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. You see, what name are you talking about? What name is going to be on your lips? Are you talking about the person that's going to kill you and you're magnifying the problem? You're magnifying cancer? Is cancer, if you got cancer, the worst thing you can do is talk about cancer. You need to start talking about the healer. You need to be talking about Jesus. You need to be careful what name you're remembering. Amen. Not in my notes, but you needed it. Verse 36, your servant has killed both lion and the bear, his, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Side note, they're all hiding in tents, but he has defied the, it's the, the point here is not the armies. The point is the living God. See, God's not hiding in the tent with you. He's out on the battlefield waiting for you. Preach, preach, preacher. That's some good preaching right there. All right. Verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. We need to be like David. That's who we need to be like right now. There, the little shepherd boy David stood in front of the Philistine giant Goliath. He stood in front of his biggest challenge, the biggest challenge he's ever had, right there. He, he stood before the king of Israel who said, you can't do this. He stood before his brothers, also in that, that, that area. They, they said, what are you doing here? You're such a dumb kid. Get out of here. He stood in front of people that didn't believe him. No one believed in him. No one had like banners going up, David's our champion. No, not at all. But yet he stood there. David reached back and said, the God who was with me. I remember a little about the God who's with me. The God who was with me helped me kill a bear. The God who was with me right now helped me kill a lion. And that same God is with me now. He's about to deliver this giant to my hands. You see Israel, you see Redemption Church. That's how you remember and that's how you walk into victory. In the middle of your hardship, you end up playing video footage in your head. You, you, that's how you think of things, right? You, you see pictures, you see moving uh, film in your head and you, you think in that moment, you see in the moment your, your defeat coming. You're, you're thinking, you see the defeat coming, you see the people laughing at you, you see uh, the failure, you see the walk of shame as, as you're walking out. Now, you can play those scenes of people laughing at you, people telling you, I told you you couldn't do that, David. Or you can remember what God has done for you. If you take time to remember what God has done for you, You see, you can operate in fear or you can operate in faith. Why don't we start running some video in our head about what the Lord has done for us? Why don't we start running some faith video in the head of what God is going to do for us? That's what the people of God ought to be doing. Psalm 103 verse 2, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. If, you're, if your praise is stagnant, if you're like in the presence of God and everybody's singing and you're like not connecting and you're like, I just don't know what's going on. I just don't feel God today. I'm just not feeling it today. Can I ask you something? Have you forgotten something? Have you forgotten all the Lord has done for you? Have you forgotten his benefits? Because you, when you remember his benefits, you, no one has to tell you to start praising him. You start praising him. That's how it works. If your faith is lacking courage and boldness, can I suggest maybe you've forgotten some of the things that God has done. If you're freaking out, you're full of fear. If you're sitting there going today uh, at me and you're going, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You're not facing this in my life. I, I get that. But can I just suggest to you, maybe you've forgotten. Have we forgotten Redemption Church? Sometimes... The way, the way we are not bold 
the way we're not courageous, the way we're not passionate, that those levels dipping in our lives, maybe we need to reach back, go back to the riverbed, pick up a rock and declare God did this for us. We walk through on dry ground. God won this victory for me and he's gonna win the next victory for me too. So it's important that you remember, right? You get it? God's done something for you. You got to remember it. But there's another counterpart that you need to know to this story. Here's what you need to know. The enemy. The enemy steals. Jesus tells us in John 10.10 about the enemy. The enemy is the one that has come to do three things. What are they? Very good. Kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy comes to steal. Deal. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 13 of an enemy that comes to steal the word of God from the person who hears it. Do you know this parable? Matthew 13 and 4. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the roadside, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seed, tells us, was scorched by the sun, and it withered up. Other seed was choked up by the weeds that represent the cares of this life. There are forces out there that want to steal the word of God right out of your heart. The parable of the seed. The seed is the word of God. And there is an enemy that wants to swoop in and steal it. There is an enemy that wants to see it wither up and die. There is an enemy that wants to choke it out. In each case, the seed is always victorious in the parable of the, the, the seed and the sower. The seed is always victorious. The question is, what is the soil going to do with it? And who's going to hold on to the seed? And who's going to take it and not let the enemy have it? Can I tell you that forgetting victories is a defeat? I want you to say that out loud with me. Forgetting victories is defeat. The enemy can't stop God from doing miracles in your life. Man, that's some good news right there. If there's anybody that can stop God from doing miracles, I've not met him. God does what God does and you just just better be happy about it because God's all powerful. The enemy, the devil wants to stop the work of God but he's never been able to do it. He never will do it. He can't Stop it. But as soon as the miracle happens, as soon as God speaks to you, as soon as God does the supernatural thing in you, as soon as you have received the word of God, anybody ever receive a word from God? As soon as you've received that, the enemy seeks to steal it from you. The enemy seeks to make you doubt it or reject it. He does it every time. Look, real quick, maybe you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, you do. Let me bring it down to you to this way. You have, ever have God kind of tell you to do something and you're like, oh, man, God told me to do something. But if you wait, you'll end up going, wait, I don't know if that was God. I think that was God. I mean, that could have been God, but it could have been me just doing silly things. I better not do it. What just happened there? You missed out. Somebody came in there and snatched away your victory. Someone snatched the word of God. God spoke to you. I've been there. I've done it. I've been on both sides of that situation. It is so lousy to not walk into the miracle, to the victory, to the harvest that God has for you and to allow the enemy to steal it. Raise your hand real quick. You know what I'm talking about. You've experienced that. Yeah, God did tell me to. Yeah, God did tell. I felt like I was supposed to do something in worship today and I just, I just wasn't comfortable doing it. I didn't know if that was God. Let me tell you, if, if you hear a voice in you that says, worship God. That's God. It's not the devil. It, it's not the devil. Real simple. If you hear a voice that says, tell those people about Jesus. That's God. Okay, that's not the devil. Right? A house divided against itself shall not stand. The devil's not telling you to go tell those people about Jesus. If you feel this strong voice, urge to do something courageous in the name of Jesus and to step out in ministry and to trust God like you've never trusted him before. Who do we think it is? Come on, somebody help me. That's God. That's God. 
And when you wait on it, every time you wait on it, if you wait just a few moments, the enemy will come and steal that from you. I've told you the story about John Heesberger, my friend in Waco. God told me, I didn't know this guy, except that he was just the biggest nerd in school. And God told me, be that guy's friend, I will save him. And I was sitting there going, wow, God spoke to me. That's so cool. But I waited 30 seconds. And suddenly that fear came. Maybe that wasn't God. Maybe you look like an idiot. Maybe you look wrong. Maybe that was you. And I struggled with that. But God was so merciful. God was so graceful and so patient with a dunderhead like me. I finally wrestled up the courage to say, I think it was God. I would turn to my dad. And I, some of you know this story. I love this story so much. I'll share it with you again. <laughs> I turned to my dad. I, I, told my, I was about to tell my dad, Dad, God just told me to be friends with that boy that God was gonna save him. I was gonna say those very words out of my mouth. And before I could say them, Dwight, my dad turned like lightning. I've never seen him move so fast in my life. He turned to me and went, Christopher! That boy back there, I don't know who he is, but God wants you to be his friend. He's gonna save him. And in that moment, I tell you, I wanted to cry right there in public because God had given me this word. I was wrestling with it, but God confirmed the word again because it's that important. No, I don't want the enemy to steal this from you. No, I'm not gonna let this. I'm gonna give another confirming word. Now, still, I could have turned away from that. Oh, my dad's just crazy. No, how disobedient would that have been? You gotta remember that God really said that to you that he really confirmed that in you. And then you walk out on it. Baby, it's the voice of God. You're gonna be just all right. You just trust God, amen? Amen. Man, I tell you, I've gone back to that day before and I said, man, 17-year-old Chris Fluitt would have the guts to go trust God right now. So 35-year-old Chris Fluitt, you got no excuse. 17-year-old Chris Fluitt, who couldn't rub two scriptures together, went back there and he befriended that guy. So you, my friend, you got no excuse. Eight-year-old Chris Fluitt, who found Jesus at an altar and had Jesus change his life. And he went to school the next day and said, I need to tell my friends about Jesus. He would do what you're not doing. 35-year-old Chris Fluitt. Wake up. Remember. Remember. I was ministering to a young teenager who was trying to come to faith. We're very patient with people that are trying to come to faith. You come on at your own pace. We love you. He was asking how I could know God was real. How can you know? How can I know God's real? So I asked, have you ever felt God's presence? Have you ever felt that he loves you? I mean, we talk about it, but have you felt that? Have you experienced his presence? He said, no, like he had never even contemplated that was possible, that, that you can encounter God. This was news to him. I told him the next time he's in worship or the next time he has a moment, he, he just put on some music, just listen to worship and talk to God and say, God, I want to know you're real and just tell him that and watch what God does. The next time we spoke, the very next time we spoke, he had this huge grin on his face. Knew what exactly was gonna happen. He said, Chris, God is real. I felt his presence. He is real. Can anybody witness? Anybody ever have an experience like that? He is real, praise God. Are we still excited about stories like that? Are we still excited? Chris, I... I know that God is real. This was one of those moments like Israel crossing over the Jordan. This was a moment that he needed to remember. But I got to tell you, the enemy was present. Troubles came into his life. And suddenly this kid can't be found. I try to get in touch with this guy. I like use every social media out there trying to get a hold of him. Finally, I track him down and he says, Chris, I just don't know that God is real. I'm like, what? What just, what just happened? You didn't know what God is real. God revealed himself to you. You felt him. And now 
I don't know God. What, what has happened in this timeline? So what did I say? Okay, you don't know God is real. Uh, it's like deja vu. I know we've been there. Do you remember that time you worshiped God and you felt his presence and you were so excited that you felt his presence? He looked me in the eyes and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember that. Let me tell you something. You would miss the point if you were mad at the teenager who forgot something about God. That's not the point. Jonathan, the point is that there was an enemy that reached down into his heart and stole that precious moment from him. There is an enemy. There are birds that come to eat the seed. There, are, there is an enemy that, like the sun, tries to scorch it. Jesus looks at Peter and he says, the enemy desires to have you. The enemy desires to sift you as wheat. Do you know what it means to sift? Well, in this uh, context, he's talking about wheat. And this is how you sift wheat. You beat the wheat up so it's all cracked. And then you sift it. And all the good fruit of the, of the wheat falls into the basket. And he, the enemy takes that. And what's left on top is broken chaff. Jesus looks into Peter and says, Satan wants to beat you up and steal everything I've ever deposited in you. You've got a harvest coming, Peter, and Satan desires to steal it. He desires to take every bit of it. Everything I ever told you that was true, and you looked at me and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Satan wants to beat you up, so one day you would say, I don't even know that man. Satan desires to steal from you. He desires to steal your harvest. He wants to remove the seed of the word of God just like he did in this teenage boy. I want to tell you that forgetting victories is defeat. It's not enough for God to cross the Jordan. It's not enough for you to experience him in the moment. It's not enough for you to know in that moment, oh, God's really cool and he's on my side. No, you got to remember it and you got to hold on to it and you got to stop. What does Jesus pray for Peter? He says, but I'm praying for you. The The enemy wants to sift you as wheat, but I'm praying for you. What does he pray? That your faith fails not. He doesn't fail. He does not pray. I just hope the devil gets distracted and works on somebody else. He doesn't pray that. He doesn't pray. I hope that the devil just stubs his toe and gets scared and runs away. No, he says, I pray that what I've deposited in you is so much stronger than the work of the enemy. That it doesn't fail you in the time. Do you have a faith that hasn't failed you? I'm telling you, you could be going through hell. You could be, you could be in this room and feeling sick. But I want to tell you, is your faith here? Man, if you got faith, the Bible tells us that this is our victory. Even our, let's quote some things it's not. This is our victory. Even our ability to quote scripture. This is our victory. Even that we have perfect church attendance. This is our victory. Even that we give in the offering. No, he says, this is our victory. Even our faith. Don't let him steal that from you. It doesn't belong to him. You would be wrong to be mad at the teenager. I'm mad at the enemy that swoops in to steal his victory. Can I just be frank with you, Redemption Church? I see a church that ought to be operating at a higher level of victory. I see a church that ought to be operating at a higher level of passion. I ought to see a church that is praying and asking God, use me for your service. What has happened? Where are we? Has somebody stolen something from us? Already the enemy is moving to steal the word that you're hearing right now. He's already at work at it. He works tirelessly. He can't stop the blood of Jesus. He can't stop Calvary. He can't stop the grace and mercy of Jesus. But he can little by little distract you. Little by little make you doubt. Little by little make you fear. But he is a liar and God's word is true. He is a liar and God's faith, the faith that comes from Jesus brings victory. Anybody believe it in this house? You believe it. I believe that with all that's in my heart. 
He's already at work to remove the experience you had in worship today. The clarity, the direction, the calling that God has given you, the enemy is swooping down to take it. Don't forget. Humans are good at forgetting. Remember. I want to close with this. I want to encourage you. I want to charge you today to fight to remember. You got to fight to remember. Jude 1 and 3 says it like this. Jude is such a great book. It's one chapter long. If you've never read a a book of the Bible, read Jude today, all right? Uh, Verse 3. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. What is Jude saying here? He's saying, I felt like I just had to tell you, you need to fight to remember. You need to fight to receive that faith. You stood in the very presence of God, believer, and you saw him do those things. You better hold on to that. I felt like I needed to tell you to fight, to contend for the faith. First Timothy 6 and 12, Paul says this. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold. How do you take hold? I'm going to hold. I just, you ever walk a big dog? I'm going to just go walk the big dog. No, you are like holding on. You need to take hold like you're walking your baby Rottweiler that you call peaches and cream. Peaches, come back. Take hold of it. Take hold of eternal life, which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, pause here. When in the church today, we have people that, that all over the church world, they make a good confession. And they do it in the presence of many witnesses. But they don't always take hold of that eternal life. Sometimes it doesn't last past the moment where they say the sinner's prayer. Oh, man. Verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep his command, to keep it, to hold on to it, have it in you, present, that command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not happened yet, right? Let's check. Check and see. That's not happened yet, right? Jesus hasn't come back for his church yet. He, we are still waiting on Jesus, right? So we still need to be taking hold. We still need to be holding on. We still need to be keeping his command. The enemy is stealing from you. But here's how you beat the enemy. Here it is. Revelations 12 and 11 talks about these people that were going through absolute hardship in Revelation. And it says they overcame him. The him is Satan. The him is the serpent. The him is the dragon. The him is your greatest adversary. The him is the Goliath in your life. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, but not just the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. The testimony that's in you, Patricia, it doesn't just give you good goosebumps in the moment. It defeats It kills the enemy just like David killed Goliath. If you don't feel like you have the victory, have you picked up some stones from the riverbed? Have you taken some time to remember? Have you taken some time to say, this is my testimony of Jesus Christ? Are you remembering? Are you holding to the faith? Are you building memorial? Are you overcoming by the blood of the Lamb? by the word of our testimony. We do three things every time we come to Redemption Church. We have worshiped God together. That's number one. We have received the word of God together. Now it is time for you to do something with the presence that's already in this house. I feel God's presence in this place. It's time for you to do something with that. And it's time for you to do something with this word. This altar is open. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't give the enemy a foothold, a moment to come in and 
strip from you what the Lord has given you. If you want prayer in this place, you come in the first two feet. We want to pray with you. We want to see God do powerful things. If you just need somebody to testify to you and tell you about the goodness of Jesus, you come in the first two feet. If you don't come in the first two feet, no one's going to bother you. This is a you and Jesus moment. Have a you and Jesus moment. Maybe you take a moment and you repent and you say, God, forgive me for not listening. Forgive me for not holding on. Forgive me, God, for listening to the wrong voices. God, I'm ready to serve you.